Hello, everyone. Um, once again, glad to be here. Um, so how many of you have heard of Fosse? Okay, not too many. All right, OK. OK, um, so Fosse is this project in, based out of India. So I'm from IIT Bombay in India. Um, and it's basically a MHRD stands for the Ministry of Human Resources and Development. Uh, it's a ministry in the government of India. And they have this program called the National Mission on Education through Information, Communication, and Technology. It's called NMEICT. Um, so in 2009, they started this project called um, NMEICT. And under that banner, they had several categories. One category was um, uh, you know, generating learning content. So they have this huge project called NPTEL, um, National, Program and National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. A lot of acronyms, I know. Um, but that's kind of like MIT's OCW. They have about 900 courses online that you can view from anywhere. And the idea is to improve the education quality in India. Um, one part of this massive uh, mission was to also try to eliminate or minimize the use of commercial software in um, education, higher education specifically. So the project that we have, FOSSI, is one project in that umbrella. Um, and FOSSI stands for Free Open Source Software uh, in Science and Engineering Education, but it's been expanded to just education. So the project objectives are to increase the use of FOSS in education, minimize the use of commercial software in education. That's kind of the big goal. Now, that's obviously a very nebulous and large goal, um, but so we try our best to get there. So what are the problems in India? Well, of course, there's a lack of funding. A lot of people buy MATLAB licenses. Um, so we know the usual problems with buying commercial licenses, especially when you're cash strapped. Um, the issue with shifting is that there's a limited awareness of what the alternatives are and how you can shift. And there's also a reluctance to shift because usually uh, instructors in colleges have too much on their hands. They're teaching typically several courses. It's not like in US universities. Uh, many of the other universities, teachers have like pretty much full-time teaching load. Um, so retraining them is kind of hard. And they're not going to go out of their way to you know, retool their uh, stuff. There's also a lack of support. As in, you know, uh, you go on a forum or a mailing list, you already need to be a reasonable netizen. You need to know the correct appropriate netiquette, and you need to be able to ask the right question before you get an answer. Um, so the idea for us is to you know, introduce some teaching aid so that we spread awareness and help people bootstrap themselves, um, write documentation in some form, and you know, give them some forum support and stuff like that. So this is the big picture. Um, but we promote several packages. It's not just Python. So I am taking care of the Python side. So there's Python. There's also Scilab. And the reason we cite Scilab is it's like a one-to-one, -one, not quite one-to-one, -one, but it's like an equivalent. It's easy for someone doing MATLAB to directly switch to Scilab. There's another group that's looking at computational fluid dynamics because ANSYS Fluent is big in the market, and there's like open form. So they're looking at open form, and they have uh, training material for that. Um, there's another group looking at operations research tools and how to spread the awareness about that. Um, there's another group that's actually building a piece which, uh, which accumulates a bunch of existing uh, electronic design uh, analysis tools, EDA tools. Uh, it's called eSIM. Um, there's another one called OSDAG, which is open steel design software. Um, there's another which tries to think of a lab view kind of replacement. It's called Sandhi. We also have projects where we try to help people integrate with hardware. Um, so there are like 14 PIs, about eight of whom are really active. Uh, I only looked at the most active ones. The general idea, the general approach we take is you know, to do some support on forums. We have a specialized forum for this. We build something called textbook companions. I'm going to explain some of these in much greater detail. Uh, we do some software development, but that development is targeted towards not improving necessarily a particular software package, but it's actually make sure that we can spread the message better. Um, hardware development and inter interfacing. We help people migrate their labs. So, so let's say there's a lab that's an electrical engineering lab that wants to run um, MATLAB. They're running MATLAB. We want to help them switch. So they have a bunch of lab experiments. We go there and try to help them transfer it to, say, Scilab. Um, then, of course, workshops, conferences, and a lot of advertisement and promotion. Now, all of these don't necessarily translate to each individual sub-project. So in the Python group, what we do is we build something called spoken tutorials. I'll come to that in a bit. 
Um, we have a course that we offer at IIT Bombay that's inspired by SWC, and I'm going to talk about that as well. We have an online testing interface, which I'm going to demo in a bit. And then we also uh, take part in the textbook companions, and we also conduct SciPy India. So this is kind of the overview of the activities. So what are these spoken tutorials? Well, so in 2009, we started doing workshops, like two-day workshops, teaching people Python. And these are non-CS people. <laughs> Programming skills may not be great. We kind of jump in, have them, first two lines that they do, they plot something. You know? So we kind of dive them right in into, into plotting and actually doing something with Python. The Problem is it didn't scale. We did 20 workshops, and at the end of it, you're sick of teaching the same material 20 times. You can scale it by having other instructors, but sometimes it's not as effective, because the other trainers may not share your same uh, approach. They may not have the same knowledge. You know, it's kind of difficult to scale. And you have 3,000 colleges in India. It's very, very hard to scale. So what we figured is that instead of having people physically go to workshops, if you can build material that allows people to do self-learning, that scales much better. So this is a sister project called Spoken Tutorial Project. And that's the website. I'll show it to you in a bit. Um, they have spoken tutorials for a variety of things. And spoken tutorial is very simple. It's just a screencast. But it's a carefully designed screencast. I'll show you quickly. They've trained over 1.2 million users on various things, not just Python. Only 40,000 of them are Python, because the market is kind of different in India. I mean, a lot of people want to learn C, because that's what gives them jobs for that, uh, or Java. But then we train them. You know, There's training material for all of that. I'll quickly show you. Um, so that's our main website. And as you can see, there are like several of the projects. You, know, you can dig in and find out about them. That's the Spoken Tutorial website. I, I don't know if it's visible. Can I? Is that visible enough? So you can see that you know, they have spoken tutorials on all of these topics. You know, name it. It's pretty much there. And the other nice thing is there are multiple languages. Because we do the spoken tutorials very carefully, we support there are 22 languages in India. Right? So, and it's nice to be able to teach 22 recognized languages. There are way many more languages than that, but there are 22 recognized ones. So the idea is if you have, say, let's say, let's pick, say, um, Akash Pigeon Stool. I don't know if that, OK, that only has one in English. So some of them don't have it in um, another language. Let me pick something else. OK, so C and C++ has it in Assamese, Bengali, English, English USA. I don't know what, the, but the dialect. OK, Gujarati, Hindi, Kannada, Malayalam, Marathi, Nepali, Oriya, Punjabi, blah, blah, blah. You actually click on this, you'll get tutorials. The idea is we don't do full translation. People still need to sell themselves. You know, They need to get a job. And so even though they're more comfortable in their native language, we teach them the interface and all of that in English. But the instruction medium is in the translated language. Right? So if you look at, say, the Python material, we don't yet have translations. But the idea is, so this is typically one of the Python tutorial. Here's an embellishing the plot. Um, I'm going to make it a little smaller so you can kind of see the elements. There's the entire script. Um, there's a link to the forum. So you can actually ask questions and get them answered. Um, there's an outline. There's an instruction sheet and an installation sheet. There are, you can post a question. There are prerequisites. There's a script, and there's a timed script. And that's how we make sure that you can actually do a translation to something else. So this is actually led by a sister project, and they have a huge network. So the idea is, if you're a software project and you want to spread, you can basically make these spoken tutorials. It's a bit hard to make them, because you know, they want to make sure that it has a bunch of quality assurance. And they also do what's called a novice check, which means they get a novice to actually run through the instructions and make sure it works. And then they will spread it out to like tens of thousands of colleges. And so if you look at the statistics, it's pretty amazing the kind of stuff that they have. So if you look at the statistics, there's, you can actually filter out. You can look at the total number of participants, the total number of workshops. That's 27,650 workshops that were conducted. And these are kind of distributed. So it's a nice mechanism to reach out to a huge audience. And that's kind of, we find that this scales well. All right. So that's spoken tutorial. So for the Python group, we had like 37 old ones. We're trying to rewrite those. It's taking a while, but we have about 51 more in the pipeline. Um, um, and we have this for pretty much all of the projects. For example, for open form, we have like some 16 tutorials that cover the basics. And then, so this is not enough. This just teaches you a basic programming tool or a programming language, right? Um, you want to be able to teach something like software carpentry. And you'd be surprised that even in some of the best institutions, people still use Excel to make undergrads use Excel to make plots, and that's really frustrating. Um, so the idea is we want to introduce a course where students, you know, you come to, they, the idea is if the student goes through this course, he comes to you, he can actually start doing actual meaningful computational science. Uh, same exact thing that software uh, carpentry. So in 2009, we designed this course, inspired heavily by software carpentry. 
Um, a reference text is Anthony and Katie's awesome book as well. Um, anyway, so it's useful for curricular needs of a student, and it's a course that actually runs at IIT Bombay. I'm teaching it next semester with two other instructors. Um, same ideas, teach how to use a Unix shell, version control, basic and advanced Python, plotting and numerics of Python using LaTeX, test-driven development, at least the basic idea and the uh, common sense approach there. And then we ask them to take student projects and apply what they've learned. The material for this is not necessarily the greatest. We have to really sit and work on it a little more, but it's called 10, right? okay, awesome. Um, it's there on GitHub. You can check it out by all means. So some lessons from that exercise of teaching this SW, not SWC, SDES. It's called Software Development Techniques for Engineers and Scientists. That's the course at IIT Bombay. Um, one thing we found that students tend to do their projects in the last minute, as usual. Uh, and we need more systematic assessment. Um, and picking projects is actually hard. You know, students tend to pick something really ambitious, and then at the end they can't do anything, and it's like a, uh, it's a sham sometimes. But then, so it's, it, it's some, one of the ideas we're thinking of is, you know, take an existing project and try to improve it, you know, add, do the full workflow. Uh, it's a work in progress. One important thing that comes out of this process of trying to teach students is that, well, can we do test-driven education, right? No one likes to grade. And if you have a large class, it's really hard to grade. Um, so can we make it fun? So um, I set out to build a tool, um, I think 2011, inspired by a programming contest I saw at PyCon Asia Pacific. Um, there was a lovely contest he ran to, uh, at Sing, based on SingPath. There's a link actually there. Um, basically, he ran a competition at the conference, which is a lot of fun. So it's basically a Django app. So he had it on Google App Engine. But, uh, so I rewrote something, uh, hack, and then kind of cleaned it up. Uh, it's open source. It's available from that URL. Um, the idea is you can do an online test where people get instant feedback. So I have a live demo. All my devs are actually sleeping in India right now. So if something breaks, we're kind of blown out of the water. But I invite you to actually visit this and take a test. So let's try. So if you go to, I'll give you the URL, yaksh, Y-A-K-S-H dot F-O-S-S-I-E-E dot I-N slash exam. You can just try it. Is anyone going to try or should I just write? OK. Is, are you on it? OK, so there's a, um, all right, so there's, you can log in with Google. Does that work? All right, so I'm going to log in. I'm a moderator on the course. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to monitor it, look at, well, no one else has started. Has anyone else gotten in? OK, let me start an incognito. Uh, Oh, man. Never do live demos, they say. Um, OK. Login again. So I'm going to try. All right. Oops. There you go. Does that work? OK. So now, once you get in, you get this course. You just enroll. It's open enrollment, which means you automatically get signed up. There's a demo quiz there. There are no prerequisites for that. Click on that, and you should get something that looks like this. All right? Um, anyone there yet? Let me check. Yeah, so we have Ben Lassock there. Oh, now we have a lot of people. The nice thing is I can actually look, on, look at your attempts, all right? And as you submit stuff, I can see what you're doing, all right? So Big Brother is watching. Um, all right, so I'm going to start my exam, so we'll see how it looks. So that's like the question paper. You can say, write a Python function, blah, 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 call counter, which will take one string argument. It's too long, so I'm going to skip and go to the next question. Um, okay. Python function to find the Fibonacci series. Okay. Well, a student wrote this, so his English may not be great, so it's, pardon me. That's the output. That's the program you're supposed to write. So I'm supposed to create a function called Fibonacci. Takes one argument, so I can say def. Okay. And I can say check my answer, and it's going to say. So now this output could have been much better. It just says assertion error. I expected this, you didn't get this. So I usually teach them, okay, you know what that means? That's tried this, you didn't get this. But then, you know, I could say, for example, let's try to break it. 
I'll give you a while loop. Uh, infinite loop, it happens, and I've done this myself, you know, I forgot to increment a counter, you don't want to be stuck, so it's going to say, oops, well, it took more than two seconds, we can change that number, you probably have an infinite loop in your code, go check your code. So the nice thing is, you're encouraged to keep trying, and every submission you make, so I'm going to see what I did, uh, I think I should show up here, oh, that's me, um, and you can see what I submitted each time. So this is really, really nice because as an instructor, I can actually do a tutorial in class. I can say, if I find out that my students aren't doing so well, I can call them, have a tutorial session, and then I can actually see what they're typing and walk to one of them and say, hey, sit down next to them saying, hey, you know what's going on? You seem to be struggling. Sit next to the person and help them or send a TA to them or something like that. Um, so this is, I found this extremely effective when I'm teaching students programming. Um, it really helps that you can take the test uh, online. So you know, I could actually submit uh, questions. Um, okay, so I can do, you can do C questions. So there's a C++ question over here. I'm sorry, I should move it up. But actually, you can write C code, all right? Uh, you can finish it and check the answer, and it'll work for C code as well. You can keep attempting. You can also do multiple choice. So you can use this as a you know, general purpose testing question. So you can have multiple choice questions, whatever you want. Um, as an instructor, um, it's really convenient because I can monitor, I can get statistics for my course, the usual you know, bunch of stuff. I can pull out the data, I can create my own questions, I can create a bunch of question papers, I can select from questions, I can have a random pool of questions, a whole bunch of things. The other nice thing is, um, oh, I forgot. We also have an API. Which means I could embed this quiz in an IPython notebook. This API is still alpha, but the nice thing is, uh, okay, so if I run this, that's the quiz. So now if I log in, um, mm, sorry. I hope this works. Oh yes, okay. So I have an interface here. It's super easy to create. That is all the HTML you need to embed. You give it the question ID from your quiz, um, and then it'll embed the questions, and you can put it anywhere, on your website, on a, on a iPython notebook, people can take it home, take it home, and it's linked, you can, they can log in so you kind of know who they are. All right, so let's get back. So the nice thing is, yeah, so you can create courses, uh, quizzes and questions, you can do coding questions, MCQs, multiple correct choice, it supports Python, C, C++, Java, works on Docker as well as, and you can have a Docker image that's actually executing the code, so no one can blow up your machine. Everything is logged, so even if someone does do and wipe out you know, some inf piece of infrastructure, it's logged separately on a separate machine, so you kind of know someone played uh, dirty, and you can take necessary action. Uh, it has an alpha web API, which is not checked in yet, and also it's gonna have file support. So if you want to do Git-based tests, you can say, okay, here's a Git repo, and every time it's gonna load that question, it'll give you that repo, you can then ask them a question and ask them to do something, and you can download that file. It's something that's being worked on. There's a pull request that still needs to be reviewed. But the idea is, now, the, I've used this last semester to teach a first year course on data analysis, but I wanted to teach them Python first. Um, and then, so, I actually give them tests to grade, to actually get them, uh, you know, trying this out and to grade them. Okay. Made, made a big difference, because I didn't have to manually grade this. I also used it as tutorials. Um, and this monitoring is really useful, as I explained. And the thing I realized was, what I initially did was gave them a bunch of IPython notebooks, or every class I'll give them an IPython notebook, and expected that they'll go home and try it out. They never did. And then I gave them a bunch of assignment questions, and saying, please try this, and make sure you, you're good at this. And then started giving them these programming questions. The instant I did that, I realized that even the good students couldn't finish a question paper, even though most of the questions were from the assignments that I actually gave them. And then I realized, you know, you have to test early and you have to test often. And then once I started doing that, I could actually count and find out who's doing well, who's not doing well, and then catch them and make sure they can do that. So this is available. Please feel free to use it. It's probably broken in various places. It's open source. Please submit an issue. Um, we're excited to share this. And now for something really exciting. It's something called textbook companions. Now, you can take a textbook. So how do students contribute documentation? It's kind of hard, right? They don't know enough, they can't contribute. So you take an existing textbook, convert all the solved examples, all right? And then you get an IPython notebook with the solved examples with the code. 
So this is awesome because any student can do it if they know basic Python. It's a very different kind of documentation. It's very easy to scale up. And it's all hosted here, tbcpython.fossy.in. And we have 427 completed textbooks, 5,822 notebooks, and 126 in progress. That's a huge amount of information. So I'll just show you quickly what it is. Pardon me if I take a little bit of extra time. Do I have a minute? OK. So that's the hosting interface. Um, this is, again, open source. Every textbook is checked in on GitHub as well. But we have an interface where you can, you know, they have nice screenshots. Every chapter of the book is separated out. So this one has, like, huge number of chapters. You can download the entire book. You can find out who, con oops, I'm sorry, who contributed it. Uh, you can even find where this book is supposedly on in GitHub. That's the chapters in GitHub. Um, and you can interact with this, thanks to IPython Notebooks. We host that. You can comment on them. So there's this little thingy here, which actually takes you to a discuss discussion. So you could actually post a comment saying, hey, awesome, or there's this bug, or whatever. And we have something which trolls it. And that's kind of the, you know, the notebook. We also have our own little hosting. If you hammer on this too much, it may not survive. It's just some digital ocean machine sitting somewhere. And it'll fire up a tempnb instance, and you can actually use these notebooks. So this is a huge amount of uh, uh, user-contributed content. We have some people at FOSSI who help you know, manage this. We also conduct conferences at SciPy India. We've done seven of those, um, pretty sizable crowd. Um, it's an early December 2016. I hope to see some of you there. Um, the next thing is we want to get into schools. Just last few slides. Um, we want to get into schools. So far, we didn't get into schools, but we want to push Python in schools. And there's a big, bit of a backstory there, but I'm running out of time. But we want to push there as well. We need your help. So if you know people who are, are excited about this, who are passionate about this, unfortunately, this is not industry, it's academia. So I know I can't pay Google salaries. But if you're passionate about this, please send people our way. We really want people who can help us you know, spread this. Um, we have a bunch of things we want to do. That's the team I want to make sure. So it's not I didn't write most of that code, but the initial parts maybe. Um, that's Tripti on the left. She's, she, she actually reviews all of the textbooks that are submitted. So it's a huge amount of work. Every week she reviews like uh, about three textbooks a day that get submitted. So you just do a lot of reviewing. Um, the other four guys, there's Aditya, there's Mahesh, there's Ankit, and there's Prathamesh. They're all on the Python team. This is just the current team. We've been around for seven years, so we've had a batch of people streaming in and out. We have also, this is a picture taken at SciPy 2015 of the larger team with the administrative staff and the managers and so on. Um, thank you. I'm sorry, I exceeded a little bit. We have uh, yeah, time for maybe one question while the next people set up. OK. Um, where are it's the next talk? Did I hear you? Oh, there you are. Prabhu, what about the copyright uh, concerns of the textbook publishers? Excellent question. So this was something that um, I think Professor Kannan was the one who actually came up with this idea, and he's thought through this. Um, we do not copy any of the actual content from the textbook. All we say is there's a link to the actual textbook. We, don't, we just say this page number, that example, this is the code. We don't reproduce anything from that textbook, actually. It's just a Python translation of, say, a question that you've solved. So supposing you take a math textbook which has SymPy-like expressions. You solve it with Python just to show them how it's done. We link to the actual textbook. So you can actually, there's an ISBN number. You can actually go buy the book if you want. And so we kind of circumvent it by not really reproducing the intent. And we're not doing this unsolved examples, because that would be a big problem. Um, we don't solve the unsolved ones. We solve the solved ones. And it's just kind of an aid so that students can learn the material. So so far, we haven't run into problems. And it, he has run it through some lawyers. And he says that, you know, that's. That's OK. It doesn't seem to be violating an actual copyright. I am not a lawyer. So if you, if you think that we are in trouble, please let me know. And I will ask, I will send the word so that we make sure we're not doing anything wrong. But I think he did do some due diligence to make sure that, so we make explicitly sure that students don't uh, you know, verbatim copy. The, there's no text. So if you look at any of the textbooks, there's just notebook. There's like a example number, page number, done. That's, the, that's it. So there's, we don't reproduce any of actual content. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Oh, thank um, you. 
So I, to I can totally see how the, you know, you needed to switch to this system to scale up to a larger, a much larger audience. But I was just wondering, did you notice anything, you know, a um, uh, 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 difference in how well the students were learning in the, you know, person, in-person um, teaching system versus this, uh, the online system? Really, really good question. Um, to be honest, I don't know the exact answer to that because I don't manage the spoken tutorial project. And Professor Karnan Maudgalia, who's actually spoken here two years ago on the spoken tutorial project, um, will be a much better equipped to answer that because he actually has some education technology people looking at these issues. But my personal opinion is yes, there's no replacement for an actual instructor. The only thing that this spoken tutorial establishes is that you have really good quality content from a well known instructor which is carefully designed such that the hope is the students learn better and then we do a bit of an online test. That online test could be better and we want to use Yaksh in the next, as soon as it's a little more stable, we want to actually push it to the spoken tutorial team so that we can actually know that students can write the code. The second issue is we're not trying to teach them the subject matter. We're trying to teach them just a programming language or a tool. So it's not as if the spoken tutorial is a replacement for an instructor per se. The other thing we do is we also do forum support. So it's not, um, sorry, yeah. So it's, so it's not as if they, um, um, they're just left to their own devices. We actually, the FOSSI staff will answer questions that they post on a forum uh, and try to help out. So obviously it's not like having, you know, say Stefan van der Waals sitting in the room when you're teaching psychic image. It's not the same thing, but well, uh, given the scale, that's the best we can do. But yes, there is a difference. All right, great, thanks so much. Um, yeah.